the questions. Okay. So first reading is from 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 7, which we found on page 1,199. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. But just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are not distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. And the second reading, it's from John's Gospel, chapter 5, starting at verse 1, which we found on page 10, 68. <laughs> so starting at verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, Paul, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paradise. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, but Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. This is the word of the Lord. Have a seat. So, if you miss it, please, thank you very much. Um, if you open your Bible again to John chapter 5, if you'd like to have a, a close look at um, what I'm focusing on in a few minutes that uh, Peter has read to us. Um, I was going to say a few other things before we actually turn to, to that page, but it's page 1068. And Nigel, have you got the clicker in your hand? Thank you. In our um, book of Lent readings, there's quite a few of us are following um, reading from the last bit of John Scott, a little bit each day and thinking about it. Um, through Lent and Easter. The reading number 22, which was, I'm 
finding it quite helpful to subtract yeah. seven from the number so because we as Lent started exactly a week before March started. So reading number 22, we've got the 15th of March. So if, if like me, you haven't managed to do it every day and you're catching up, um, that's how you get to the right day. Last Wednesday, uh, John 16, verse 21, was remarkably relevant to mothers. And it struck me in a new way as I was thinking about it. today. Um, John 16, Verse 21 says a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, said the Lord Jesus. And I don't think the Lord Jesus ever himself personally witnessed that event, apart from when he was being born himself, which you probably didn't remember when you say these words. But that event, which I've had the privilege of being present for five times in my life, and those of you who served with midwives will have seen many more times. And looking back 21 years exactly today to the birth of Samuel, I can say Verse 21 reads like an understatement. <laughs> I had pain. My hand got squeezed beyond the point of discomfort. <laughs> what Becky had was beyond pain. She reached the point of total exhaustion in an anguish that lasted so many hours, it seemed as if it could never end well. So yes, Jesus' words were true. And he continued in chapter 16, verse 21, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. And 21 years later, she looks at our baby, Samuel, and our babies, Harry and Barnaby and Digby. And I know that she doesn't think pain when she sees them now, not normally anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she delights in them, is proud of them, takes great joy in them. And she can't wait till tomorrow when she'll have all four of them under one roof again for the Easter vacation. This was the analogy Jesus was using to encourage his friends, the disciples, when he knew that he was about to die and they would find it almost unbearable. So with you, he said in verse 22, still in chapter 16. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will ever take away your joy. That's the Easter story. But today, we're focusing on a man who got a foretaste of that Easter joy in John chapter 5. So let's go now to the sheep gate and see the third sign that John describes for us. Do you remember what Ian said about signs last week? You don't just look at a sign and admire it, gather around the sign, you see a sign, and what it's there for is that you can follow it and get to the destination. And when John put his gospel together, when he was writing about the signs that he was, the miraculous works that Jesus did, which was the signs, John writes about them not so that we can admire his writing or even get excited just about the events themselves of those signs, but to see what the sign is pointing to. And John told us that's what he's doing in chapter 20. Um, so if you've got nimble fingers and you can unstick the pages, um, feel free to turn on to John chapter 20, verse 30, where John said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See the sign. These are written. Follow it. 
but you may believe that Jesus is Messiah. Destination, you may have life in his name. And these three things are really important for John as he describes these various events to us. Evidence, faith, life. The strange things that happened wherever Jesus showed up, John describes them, and or some of them, a few of them, and majors on these three themes, evidence, testimony, faith, belief, and life in Jesus' name. Did you notice those three things in chapter 5, verses 1 to 15, as Peter read? Well, next week we'll be looking at the rest of the chapter, the second half of the story, where those three things are drawn out of what happened in verses 1 to 15. The man's testimony and other testimony and evidence for who Jesus is. Faith, not much is said about the man's faith. It's quite interesting to look for evidence of his faith there. But in fact, it's the lack of faith, the refusal to believe of some of those who see the evidence, hear the testimony, that is what John explicitly talks about in this chapter. And then the man's life is transformed when he meets Jesus. So it's about life in Jesus. Now, four things to notice in this chapter, or in these 15 verses, um, as we look now at John 5, verses 1 to 15. First, life comes through the word of Jesus. Life comes through the word of Jesus. It's a similar thing to a lot of these incidents when Jesus spoke a word and a dead child got up again. <laughs> On this day, today when we're remembering a mother's role in bringing in a new life, none of us would be here if it wasn't for our mothers. Notice that the creative power of bringing life belongs to Jesus through his word. Back in the beginning of creation, God spoke, said, let there be light. And Jesus, the word of God, brought creation into being. And looking ahead to a verse from next week's reading, verse 21, but just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. And we see an example of a poor sick man lying there by the pool, being somebody to whom Jesus was pleased to give life. Can you imagine being an invalid for 38 years? Maybe you can, that's probably easier for some people here than it is for others to imagine, and perhaps slightly even easier for some of those joining on Zoom. We don't know what this man's disability was exactly, but it made him immobile, and so John uses that horrible word about it, invalid. As if it could make a person invalid. You don't know what was making him immobile, but when you can't move around, I think your world shrinks. And how shrunken this man's world must have got when he couldn't go out to work, he couldn't get out and about and see his friends. And not only had his world and the contacts with people shrunk, how shrunken his body must have become. <laughs> I remember when I had a shoulder injury and um, this case of my left shoulder and damaged the nerve, I couldn't move my left arm for about four months. And the muscle just virtually disappeared. You could see it going in instead of out where the shoulder muscle was. And I Googled this thing and, and saw that it takes just two weeks of physical inactivity for those who are physically fit to lose a significant amount of their muscle strength. In that relatively short period of time, young people lose about 30% of their muscle strength, leaving them as strong as someone decades older. 
how long it takes to recover will depend on the amount of atrophy that occurred and your physical condition beforehand. It will take at least two weeks of physical therapy before you start to feel any difference in your muscles. It can take several months of physical therapy for muscle size and strength to be fully restored. So after 38 years of lying on this mat, how does this man jump to his feet, pick up said mat, and head off without stumbling? It's the creative, life-giving power of Jesus' word, bringing those tendons and muscles into vitality. And like the, the many people around that pool, the life that this man had been living was less than the full experience of human life is supposed to be. And Jesus is into it's his word that does that. He brings life today. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead received. He's John Wesley. Forgiveness comes through the word of Jesus. Life comes through the word of Jesus. Forgiveness comes through the word of Jesus. Verse 14 may seem troublesome for some of us. Some of us. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you're well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. What do we read into that? But was the man's original affliction God's judgment for something he had done? Well, Jesus says elsewhere that that is not normally. Sickness and suffering, which are here because of the way we human beings have messed up the world, they're in the world in an unfair way. Things might be done to us that make us suffer, and things might just happen to us that make us suffer. And sometimes it's just apparently bad luck that it's, it's not proportional to how good or bad we have been. So if you're suffering, don't add false guilt to the problem and start thinking, it must be my fault, I must be worse than everybody else. It's not to say it's never our own fault. <laughs> it is our own when we suffer. Um, and at the time, it was a common perception that this was the way it would have been that if someone was disabled, it was because of something wrong they had done. And the man might have felt very guilty, rightly or wrongly, there in his disability, but he was being accepted by Jesus. And Jesus is telling him, that this has to bring a life change for you. As we heard two weeks ago, come to Jesus as you are. You don't have to sort yourself out before you can come and hear Jesus' invitation and respond to that invitation. He is calling people who need him to come and receive forgiveness. Come to Jesus as you are and be changed by him. The words recorded that Jesus said to him in verse 8, for those words, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Do you read other parts of the Bible? Do those words ring a bell? Do you read them anywhere else as well? In uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 9, it's a different gospel, not, this bit, not written by John, but St. Jesus said these things in history. He was with a different paralyzed man. This is the one who got lowered down through the roof. Remember that story? And so uh, Jesus said to him, get up, take the mat and walk. But before that, he also said to the man, the first thing he said to the man who was there on his mat, 
having been carried on through, through the series, son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And so Jesus had a dispute then with the religious people as well, which is easier to say to the powers, man, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up your, take your mat and walk. And Jesus said to both, he gave this new quality of life, this new life, which his word does, and he gave forgiveness, which also comes through the word of Jesus. And forgiveness and life are inseparable. <laughs> the salvation that Jesus brings, being saved, being rescued, is eternal life. Eternal life starts with forgiveness, cancelling our debt, taking away our guilt, and putting us in a right relationship with God. It's a new life. That makes a difference now, it brings healing into our relationships as the Holy Spirit renews us from the inside, changes us, and brings life. It may include physical healing now, and it's good to pray for that when we're in need and when we know people who are in need. Need and what, what we long for, and trust Him to do what's best. We may end up having to wait for that full physical healing. If you're feeling the need for Jesus' new life, this new dimension of life, could it be that you're also in need of His forgiveness? And it's time to receive that now and start a new forgiven life with him. Please ask us to be afterwards and talk with you about it. Pray. In this passage, this but surprisingly. Not everyone believes. The word that brings life also brings opposition. So enter the stuffy old religious leaders, Jewish leaders. I have to put a damper on things. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. Verse 10 So the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Sad. They couldn't see the joy of the work of God in this man's life. We'll think more about this next week. But were they right? The Old Testament law was provided this gift of the Sabbath, seventh day, Saturday, to be a holy day of rest, to remember what God had done for his people and mark them out as his special people. And so the law was for rest on that day, no work. And as the year went by, people thought, well, we need a bit more clarity about exactly what it is and is work. And so they set out these 39 different categories of work that if you do this, then your work will be light of fire, if you lift the weight, or if you walk more than a certain distance from your home. Then you're working, so don't do any of those things. But really, the man's if the man's job had been carrying mats, if he was a professional <laughs> mat carrier, then they would have had the point when they saw him carrying his mat on the Sabbath. But he wasn't working, he just being healed. He, he was enjoying. The, the fullness of life that Jesus had brought him into by his word. That's the expression of, of rest at this point for him. So they got the wrong end of the stick. They should have listened to Jesus, whose word brings life and forgiveness. 
Jesus has the authority to say whether it's okay or not. And as the man said in verse 11, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And so they asked him, who, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat? Who is this man, Jesus? <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his words. Thank you that it brings life. Thank you that it brings forgiveness. And we're here this morning with our different joys and sorrows, our different experiences of life. Some of us enjoying life and your forgiveness, some struggling, some happy to be mothers or to be with their mothers, some unhappy about not being a mother or not having a not being able to see and be close to those to whom they've given birth and we're all in need of life and forgiveness from the word of Jesus so please help us to receive that and to enjoy it. Thank you for the gift of bread and wine, this special supper that the Lord Jesus gave to help us receive and enjoy his forgiveness and love. Thank you for your presence with us as we do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.